order. With that objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. I'm going to recognize myself for an opening statement, then the ranking member, the gentleman from Michigan, then the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, then the gentleman from Virginia, uh, Mr. Scott, then we will proceed uh, to hearing from the Attorney General. Attorney General Eric Holder appeared before the House Judiciary Committee last May, and we appreciate his willingness to appear today to address many issues, including questions about his previous testimony. While I am pleased to welcome back Attorney General Holder, I am disappointed in the Department's repeated refusal to cooperate with this committee's oversight request. This lack of cooperation is evident in the Department's handling of inquiries related to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, Operation Fast and Furious, and the death of Border Patrol Agent Brian Terry in December 2010. And inconsistent statements from Department officials about who knew what and when have only raised more concerns. I'm also disappointed in how the Department has responded to my oversight request regarding Justice Kagan's involvement in health care legislation or related litigation while she served as United States Solicitor General. Despite claims from Obama administration officials that then Solicitor General Kagan was walled off from discussions regarding the President's health care law, recently released emails indicate there may be more to the story. On March 21, 2010, an email from the Deputy Solicitor General forwarded to Solicitor General Kagan contained information about a meeting at the White House on the health care law and asked, I think you should go. No, I will regardless, but feel this is litigation of singular importance. Solicitor General Kagan responded by asking him for his phone number. We also know from the emails that she personally supported the legislation's passage. In a, dis in a March 21, 2010 exchange with a Justice Department colleague discussing the health care legislation, Ms. Kagan exclaims, I hear they have the votes, Larry. Simply amazing. These emails reveal inconsistencies with the administration's claims that then Solicitor General Kagan was walled off from the issue. To help clear up any confusion, I wrote the Justice Department to get additional documents and conduct staff interviews. It took nearly four months before the Department sent a one-page response that denied my request. The Department did not assert any legal privilege over the requested information, but simply refused to comply with the request. That is not a sufficient answer. Health care legislation was passed by the Senate on December 24, 2009. On January 8, 2010, Ms. Kagan told the Deputy Solicitor General that she definitely would like the Office of the Solicitor General to be involved in preparations to defend against challenges to the pending health care proposals. Ms. Kagan found out she was being considered for a potential Supreme Court vacancy on March 5, 2010. So the issue is how involved was she in health care discussions between January 8 and March 5? Just as President Nixon had an 18 and a half minute gap, does Ms. Kagan have a two month gap? The Office of the Solicitor General is responsible for defending the positions of the federal government in litigation before the Supreme Court. So it was the duty of then Solicitor General Kagan to participate in meetings and discussions regarding the legal defense strategy for the President's health care proposal. It would have been a surprising departure from her responsibilities for Solicitor General Kagan not to advise the administration on the health care bill. The law clearly states that justices must recuse themselves if they participated as counsel, advisor, or material witness concerning the proceeding or expressed an opinion concerning the merits of the particular case while they worked in a government capacity. The public has a right to know the extent of Justice Kagan's involvement with the legislation as well as any previously stated legal opinions about the legislation while she served as Solicitor General. The NFL would not allow a team to officiate its own game. If Justice Kagan was part of the administration's team that put the health care mandate into play, she should not officiate when it comes before the Supreme Court. If the Department has nothing to hide, why not provide Congress with the requested information? 
The continued refusal to cooperate with legitimate oversight inquiries only heightens concerns that she may, in fact, have a conflict of interest. President Obama has promised an open and transparent government. Unfortunately, we often see a closed and secretive Justice Department. I know all members of the committee look forward to asking questions on these and other issues. And I'll now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Conyers. Thank you, Chairman Smith. And uh, a hearty welcome to not only the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, but as well to a, uh, well, this is the most uh, numerous number of police chiefs and Department of Justice officials that I've seen in this room at one time in quite a while. All of them, but particularly to the Detroit police chief, Ralph Godby, uh, who is here, I send a special welcome. Now, uh, Chairman Smith, would it be appropriate that our colleague, a former member of the committee, Adam Schiff of California, sit on the dais with us. Um, uh, Mr. Conyers, we normally don't do that, but in this case, I'd be very pleased to have the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff, sit up at the dais with us. Uh, we, do, we do have a policy that non-members of the committee will not be uh, able to ask questions, but we certainly welcome his presence up here. I thank you for that courtesy. Adam, come on up if he can find room. Uh, the, there are two parts to my comments this morning, uh, members of the committee. Uh, the first is, deals with what are the problems underlying the reason for the hearing and the second deal more specifically uh, with the uh, career and contributions of the uh, Attorney General of the United States. And <clears throat> I have the privilege of uh, putting these solutions that I'd like you to consider out uh, in my opening statement. Uh, we can go over the details uh, ad nauseum, if you like, but I'd refer everyone to the November 8, 2011 hearings in the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary in which Chairman Pat Leahy, uh, with uh, more than a dozen uh, senators on that committee uh, have plowed through this, and I've been going over and over it for the last couple of days. Uh, but uh, I think I think you want to have that as a basis for anybody that's particularly interested. Now, the problem of gun trafficking in the Southwest is a serious problem, and I think and I recommend to my Judiciary Committee colleagues with whom this whole subject matter is the jurisdiction of this committee that we commit to maintaining the new rule requiring the reporting of multiple sales of semi-automatic weapons and shotguns, rifles uh, by individuals in the southwest border states. Uh, there have been a number of programs uh, that have dealt with this subject, uh, but I think that that's probably number one on my recommended list. Secondly, we must help, we must see to it that we confirm a director of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. It's been operating under acting directors for the last five and one half years. The Senate has failed to act on the nominations, not only of the current president, but of President Bush as well. So 
uh, if we're going to criticize ATF, I think we, we must work to revitalize it, not to tear it down because it's uh, too important a source of uh, protection and uh, ending, a way of ending violence in this important part of our country. Uh, and last, we must enact s some legislation to prohibit gun trafficking. Uh, the multiple, the transfer of multiple guns, when we know it, they will be transferred to those who are legally prohibited from carrying a gun or people who intend to use guns illegally must be further prohibited by legislative con and congressional action. I commend our New York colleague, Carolyn Maloney, who's uh, sponsored uh, a very good idea in, in this regard. And so I conclude, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, by telling you I have never encountered uh, an attorney general uh, more dedicated and more professionally effective than the, the current occupant of that chair, Eric Holder, who has, who has achieved impressive results across the full range of his mission, uh, especially what has happened in the Civil Rights Division uh, and uh, I think that the questions today here are appropriate. I think the hearing is a fair. Proceed in a manner that will make us all proud that we attended and participated in this hearing today. But we also know that letting guns roam around this country is something that all of us have a great responsibility uh, to make sure uh, that that is diminished or comes to an end as soon as possible. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Conyers, for those comments. Uh, the gentleman of from California, uh, Chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd first like to ask unanimous consent that the following document be placed in the record. Uh, December 7th, an article by Cheryl Atkinson entitled Documents, ATF Used Fast and Furious to Make Case for Gun Regulations. No, without objection, they'll be made a part of the record. I thank Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, it is deja vu all over again. We are beginning the process of getting to the bottom, to the truth of Fast and Furious. I take exception to my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Mr. Conyers. What is too important is the Second Amendment. The idea that regulations without any approval of Congress have been added to create databases in the uh, southern, southwestern states, including California, Arizona, Mexico, New Mexico, clear, Texas and New Mexico, clearly shows that in fact this administration is more interested in building databases, more interested in talking about gun control than actually controlling the drugs, or drugs and guns that they had control over. Whether it's money laundering or in fact it is the flow of guns knowingly. Just one individual was allowed to buy under the auspices of the Justice Department, 700 weapons, knowing exactly who they were going to before they ever went. Our di discovery, with the help of Senator Grassley, has shown that this was not an accident and that this project was failed and flawed from the beginning. It is not just ATF. It is not just DEA. In fact, it includes the Department of Homeland Security in a, in a task force that obviously did not respect the safeguards of the American people. Brian Terry is dead today, in my opinion, because of this failed program. But even today, 
We will not hear justice taking responsibility. They will instead talk about the two guns that were recovered. Yes, they were from Fast and Furious, but ballistics are inconclusive. And yet this Justice Department is not looking for a third weapon. They are not looking for who killed Brian Terry. Well, they try to have the plausible deniability that Fast and Furious may not have been responsible. That's reprehensible to the family suffering under Brian Terry's needless murder. Mr. Chairman, Fast and Furious began in November 2009. It was a new operation building on a failed operation under the previous administration. The difference in the previous administration is there was coordination with the Mexican government. They made a real effort under wide receiver to pass off a small amount of weapons and track them. This program, just the opposite. Even knowing the drug cartels that were going to receive them, they simply allowed them to go to the stash house. And Mr. Attorney General, today I hope you will not point fingers and say that somehow this is not organic. There is nothing more organic than law enforcement officer being gunned down because of a failure to protect within the Department of Justice. There is nothing more organic in Congress's responsibility than in fact following up on Congress being lied to. My committee, just next door, was systematically lied to by your own representatives. There is a high likelihood the individual was deliberately duped but he was duped by people who still work for you today. Still work for you today. The president has said he has full confidence in this attorney general. I have no confidence in a president who has full confidence in an attorney general who has in fact not terminated or dealt with the individuals, including key lieutenants, who from the very beginning had some knowledge and long before Brian Terry was gunned down, knew enough to stop this program. There has been recrimination. There has been an attempt to find scapegoats. Many of the people who have been pointed to do share in the blame. But Mr. Attorney General, the blame must go to your desk, and you must today take the real responsibility. Why haven't you terminated the many people involved? Why is it that we're still hearing about inconsistencies that don't even take the correct responsibility for Border Patrol agent Brian Terry's death? Those are the things we want to hear today. And Mr. Attorney General, I respect the fact that you said in the Senate that you gave truthful testimony, but I would like to hear what, when a few days becomes a few weeks or a few weeks becomes a few months, are we to have the confidence that the President says he has in you and the many people up and down the chain of command at Justice who saw this program, this operation, and let it happen, and the many people who called your uh, legislative affairs representative who's sitting right behind you caused him to bring false testimony to the committee. It is unheard of for testimony or for letters or testimony to be taken back. They've had to be taken back because of people who still work for justice. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence and I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak here and would ask that Blake Farenholt, a member of my committee who has been intimately involved in the investigation, also be allowed to sit on the dais under the same terms as Mr. Schiff. Committee, is he a member of Congress? He is a member of Congress. Mr. Uh, Issa, thank you for your... He is a freshman from Texas. He's impacted yes. by these gun control regulations. I, he is I, an attorney. I, I understand there is no room right now, but we'll consider that request in just a minute. As much as I would like to have a Texas colleague uh, up at the podium, uh, he you got a few, but he he's not a, good one. a former member of the Judiciary Committee, though we certainly appreciate his expertise on this subject. So let's wait until we have room and we'll take it up at that point. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, the ranking member of the Crime Subcommittee, is recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I join my colleagues in welcoming the Attorney General uh, this morning. I understand that the invitation to the Attorney General to appear this morning specifically referenced gun trafficking in the southwest border, so today we have an opportunity to discuss with them the positive steps we must take to protect our citizens from illegal firearms. I'm heartened that this Attorney General recognizes that the smartest and most effective way to protect ourselves from crime is to prevent it from occurring in the first place. With respect to preventing firearm violence, there are steps that we can take to reduce the toll of the injured and murdered. 
and there are steps that we must take in order to enhance the ability of law enforcement to, infectiv to effectively investigate gun crimes that have already occurred. I note, as it's often said around here, that the best strategy to use when you're in a hole is to stop digging. Unfortunately, this committee approved and the House passed a dangerous bill that would override the laws of almost every state by requiring each state to accept concealed handgun carry permits, uh, concealed handgun carry permits from other states, even if the permit holder would not be allowed to carry or even possess a ha handgun in his home state or the state where he is traveling. Actions like this make the hole deeper and do not make us safer. We in Congress uh, can best take the steps to help law enforcement prevent and investigate gun violence. Specifically, with reference to the problem of gun trafficking on the southwest border, we know that the, uh, that the rule that went into effect in August, requiring the reporting of multiple sales of certain assault weapons, is an important tool to help law enforcement fight the straw purchasing that fuels gun trafficking. Unfortunately, while that rule was under consideration, 21 members of this committee voted last February to prevent funds from being used to implement this important reporting requirement. <coughs> if that measure had been included in the final version, the, the pro pro prohibition against that reporting requirement had been included in the final version of the bill, the ATF would not be receiving these reports today and they would be denied information which is helping them investigate suspected straw purchasing. The ATF has, important, has an important role in protecting us from the dangers of illegal use and trafficking of firearms, the Ill illegal use and storing of explosives and acts of arson and bombing. We must make sure this, a this agency is capable of uh, fulfilling its important mission and it needs strong leadership. In that light, we need to encourage our Senate colleagues to confirm the President's nominee to be director of the ATF. Finally, when we, we have learned that we need to give prosecutors a critical additional tool to fight gun trafficking. For example, we need a statute that specifically prohibits the transfer of multiple firearms into, firearms into the hands of those legally ineligible to possess them and to those who intend to use them to commit crimes. I hope this committee will take action on legislation in this area in the near future. These are things we need to do to address the real problem and those who want to focus on, the, on Operation Fast and Furious and gun walking tax, tactics that it employed, I would just note that these tax, tactics originated in the ATF investigations under the Bush administration and a November 16, 2007 memo refers to the fact that so-called gun walking was already occurring in the Bush administration. In contrast, there's no evidence that Attorney General Holder knew of these tactics while they were being used and he should be praised for consistently saying that they were unacceptable and referring this matter to the Inspector General soon after he learned about them. So I thank the Attorney General for appearing here today and I look forward to his testimony. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scott. We are pleased to welcome today's witness, United States Attorney General Eric H. Holder, Jr. On February 3, 2009, Attorney General Holder was sworn in as the 82nd Attorney General of the United States. Attorney General Holder has enjoyed a long and distinguished career in public service. First joining the department through the Attorney General's Honors Program in 1976, he became one of the department's first attorneys to serve in the newly formed Public Integrity Section. He went on to serve as a judge of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia and the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. In 1997, Mr. Holder was named by President Clinton to be the Deputy Attorney General. Prior to becoming Attorney General, Mr. Holder was a litigation partner at Covington and Berlin LLP in Washington, D.C. Mr. Holder, a native of New York City, is a graduate of Columbia University and Columbia Law School. Again, we welcome you and look forward to your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? I would move that the witness be sworn. Um, um, I am going to uh, ask that the gentleman withdraw that for two reasons. Uh, first of all, the Attorney General did receive a letter from the committee uh, reminding him of the need uh, and, in effect, that he is uh, testifying under oath. And two, uh, we don't need to go through that necessarily because that is assumed uh, by anybody who does testify before the committee. Point of inquiry, Mr. Chairman. 
Isn't it true that a false statement to Congress bears a, a different criminal violation than a sworn statement? Um, I believe the answer to that is yes. And I would once again ask, uh, since this committee has at times sworn witnesses, as have all the committees, uh, that in light of oh, factual... If, if the gentleman will yield, um, I misunderstood the question and the answer was no. Uh, so it is deemed as if he is under oath right now, any witness. So he is exactly the same as if he that swears under our rules. That is correct. Uh, then I withdraw. Okay. I thank the gentleman. Uh, if the Attorney General will proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Conyers, and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to describe the decisive action that we have taken to ensure that the flawed tactics used in Operation Fast and Furious and in earlier operations under the prior administration are never repeated. Now, for nearly three years, I've been privileged to work with this committee to strengthen national security and to strengthen law enforcement, and I'm extremely, extremely proud of our record of achievement. In offices around the world, the department's 117,000 employees have made historic progress in protecting the American people from a range of unprecedented threats, from global terrorism and violent crime to financial fraud, human trafficking, and more. We have disrupted numerous potentially devastating terrorist plots and successfully prosecuted scores of dangerous terrorists. The department's efforts on behalf of the most vulnerable among us, including victims of civil rights abuses and hate crimes, have never been more effective. And the partners, partnerships that we have built with state, local, and tribal law enforcement officials have never been stronger. Today, it's a privilege to be joined by several of our key public safety partners. These five police executives, Chief Fred Bealfield of Baltimore, Commissioner Ed Davis of Boston, Chief Rodney Monroe of Charlotte, Chief Ralph Godby of Detroit, and Commissioner Charles Ramsey of Philadelphia, have been leaders in developing and implementing innovative and effective crime prevention strategies. <clears throat> they have also worked closely with the department in advancing critical efforts to reverse the alarming rise in law enforcement fatalities in recent years. The work that we do along the southwest border is influenced by the efforts that they have undertaken in their own cities. In the cities that they serve and in communities across the country, this work is a priority. And in our ongoing efforts to protect the American people and our brave law enforcement personnel, a critical area of focus will continue to be our battle against gun violence on the southwest border. Now, in recent years, the department has devoted significant resources to this fight and specifically to addressing the unacceptable rate of illegal firearms trafficking from the United States to Mexico. Unfortunately, in the pursuit of that laudable goal, unacceptable tactics were adopted as part of Operation Fast and Furious. Now, as I have repeatedly stated, allowing guns to walk, whether in this administration or the prior one, is wholly unacceptable. The use of this misguided tactic is inexcusable, and it must never happen again. Soon after learning about the allegations raised by ATF agents involved with Fast and Furious, I took action designed to ensure accountability. In February, I asked the department's acting inspector general to investigate the matter, and in early March, I ordered that a directive be sent to law enforcement agents and prosecutors prohibiting such tactics. More recently, the new acting director of ATF, Todd Jones, implemented reforms to prevent these tactics from being used in the future, including training and stricter oversight procedures for all significant investigations. Now, although the Department has taken steps to ensure that such tactics are never used again, it is an unfortunate reality that we will continue to feel the effects of this flawed operation for years to come. Guns lost during this operation will continue to show up at crime scenes on both sides of the border. As we work to identify where errors occurred and to ensure that these mistakes never happen again, we must not lose sight of the critical challenge that this flawed operation has highlighted, and that is the battle to stop the flow of guns to Mexico. Of the nearly 94,000 guns that have been recovered and traced in Mexico in the last five years, more than 64,000 were sourced to the United States. During this time, the trafficking of firearms across our southwest border contributed to approximately 40,000 deaths in Mexico. Now, the reforms that we have undertaken do not make any of the losses of life more bearable for grieving families. 
These tragedies do, however, portray ver in very stark terms the exceptionally difficult challenges that law enforcement agencies confront every day in working to disrupt illegal firearms transfers. Operation Fast and Furious appears to have been a deeply flawed effort to respond to these very challenges. As we work to avoid future losses and further mistakes, it is unfortunate that some have used inflammatory and inappropriate rhetoric about one particular tragedy that occurred near the southwest border in an effort to score political points. Now, nearly one year ago, while working to protect his fellow citizens, U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agent Brian Terry was violently murdered in Arizona. We all should feel outrage about his death, and as I have communicated directly to Agent Terry's family, we are dedicated to pursuing justice on his behalf. The Department is also working to answer questions that the Terry family has raised, including whether and how firearms connected to fast and furious end up with Mexican drug cartels. In her independent review, I expect the Department's acting Inspector General to answer these questions. I understand that Congress also wants answers. Justice Department employees have been working tirelessly to <coughs> identify, to locate, and to provide relevant information to this committee yes. and to the two other committees that are investigating Fast and Furious, all while preserving the integrity of our ongoing criminal investigations and prosecutions. The Department has been fully cooperative and responsive in its dealings with Congress. I have answered questions in the House and the Senate on four occasions concerning this matter. To date, we have provided almost 5,000 pages of documents for congressional investigators to review. We have scheduled numerous witness interviews and testified at public hearings. And just last week, we provided an unprecedented access to internal deliberative documents to explain how inaccurate information was initially conveyed to Congress. Now, these documents demonstrate that Justice Department personnel relied on information <coughs> provided by supervisors from the components in the best position to know the relevant facts. We now know that some information provided by those supervisors was inaccurate. Now, I understand that in subsequent interviews with congressional investigators, these supervisors have stated that they did not know at the time that information provided in a letter to congressional leaders earlier this year was inaccurate. The documents produced to date also belie the remarkable notion that this operation was conceived by department leaders, as some have claimed. It is my understanding that department leaders were not informed about the inappropriate tactics employed in this operation until those tactics were made public. And as is customary, turned to those with supervisory responsibility over the operation in an effort to learn facts. But what is clear is that disrupting the dangerous flow of firearms along the southwest border and putting an end to the violence that has claimed far too many lives, lives is and will continue to be a top priority for this Department of Justice. This year alone, we have led successful investigation into the murders of United States citizens in Mexico, created new cartel targeting prosecutorial units, and secured the extradition of more than 100 defendants wanted by United States law enforcement, including the former head of the Tijuana cartel. We've also built crime-fighting capacity on both sides of the border by developing new procedures for using evidence gathered in Mexico to prosecute gun traffickers in U.S. courts, by training thousands of Mexican prosecutors and investigators, by successfully fighting to enhancing sentencing guidelines for convicting traffickers and straw purchasers, and by pursuing coordinated multi-district investigations of gun trafficking rings. Now, despite this progress, we have more to do. And each of us has a duty to act and to rise above partisan divisions and politically motivated gotcha games. The American people deserve better. It is time for a new dialogue about these important issues, one that is respectful, responsible, and factual. This will require us to apply the lessons that we've learned from law enforcement officers, like the ones who sit behind me today, who protect public safety and our national security every day. In that regard, not only did ATF agents bring the inappropriate and misguided tactics of Operation Fast and Furious to light, they also sounded the alarm for more effective laws to combat gun trafficking and improve public safety. ATF agents who testified before the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform this summer explained that the agency's ability to stem the flow of guns from the United States into Mexico suffers from a lack of effective enforcement tools. One critical first step should be for Congress to provide ATF with the tools and the authorities that 
it needs. Now, unfortunately, earlier this year, the majority of House members voted to keep law enforcement in the dark when individuals purchased multiple semi-automatic rifles, shotguns, and long guns, like AK-47s in gun shops in four southwest border states. Going forward, I hope that we can work to work together to provide law enforcement agents with the tools that they desperately need to protect the country and to ensure their own safety. And for their sake, we cannot afford to allow the tragic mistakes of Operation Fast and Furious to become a political sideshow or a series of media opportunities. Instead, we must move forward and recommit ourselves to our shared public safety obligations. I am willing to work with you in this effort. I look forward to your questions. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, other members are going to ask you about Fast and Furious, so I'm going to pick a different subject and ask you about the extent of Justice Kagan's involvement with the health care legislation. Uh, my first question is this. To your knowledge, did then Solicitor General Kagan ever give advice or express an opinion on legal or constitutional issues involving the health care legislation? Uh, I do not believe so. In fact, as I testified in the Senate uh, last month, I guess, uh, we took steps to physically exclude or have right. her removed uh, when uh, conversations what, occurred. What month did that take place? When did you start excluding her from those types of meetings? I'm not sure when that started, but my memory is that uh, whenever we had conversations about the health care bill, uh, then Solicitor General Kagan and, was not present. And the reason for excluding her is because of her possible consideration for the Supreme Court? Yeah, I think okay. that's right. We understood now, that she, that was a possibility. She testified that um, she first became aware of that possibility that she might be considered in early March. So you would not have excluded her prior to early March? Well, I, you know, again, I don't know exactly when these um, events occurred, but I do feel comfortable in saying that in terms of the conversations that occurred in my conference room about the health care legislation. Right. Um, Right. But, but, but would you have had any reason to exclude her, any reason to wall her off in the words that uh, you were told by a deputy uh, prior to the time that she was considered for the Supreme Court? Well, I can tell you that with regard to, as I said, the conversations that occurred in my conference room about the health care bill, I do not remember her being okay. present for any of them. Would you be able to check your records to find out what the date would have been when you started telling her that she should uh, either excuse or recuse herself from those uh, discussions? I'll, uh, we'll attempt to do that. I'm not sure that that information exists anyplace, but to the extent okay. that it does, I'll provide it to you. Okay. And would you have a record of any meetings because of your schedule that she attended? Would I have a record? Right, of any meetings that she attended, because if you went back and looked at your schedule, I assume that that would be on your schedule. Yeah, the um, schedule for what is our 915 meeting list, the people who are expected to, right. be, expected to be there. I don't okay. sure we put, actually keep track of who actually does Okay, go. if you'll give me the dates when you started telling her that. Uh, again, I don't believe you would have any reason to exclude her before she was being considered for the Supreme Court vacancy. Uh, and as I mentioned in my opening statement, she would actually have a duty to be involved in conversations regarding the health care bill. Uh, let me go to another question. Um, this goes to some of the correspondence that I've written you asking for documents and to be allowed to interview both present and former uh, staff members. But is the department asserting a legal privilege in refusing to comply with my request for those documents and those interviews about then Solicitor General Kagan's involvement with the health care legislation? Uh, well, you know your letter to me did not assert any legal privilege. Yeah, the, the department has released documents under FOIA uh, relating to this matter, and those documents are certainly available to uh, members of the committee. Uh, the documents that we have released uh, are consistent with... Um, I'm, I'm not asking about the documents. Are you asserting a legal privilege? Is that why you are refusing to give me those documents? Well, it is our view that in terms of trying to determine uh, the answers to the questions that you have, that with regard to recusal questions, those are questions best brought um, by those who are involved in the context of the litigation. Right. And so you are not asserting any legal privilege? Well, there are, it seems to me, separation of powers concerns given the fact that members of Congress are um, amici, amicus is, or amici in, in, in the yeah. ongoing legislation. And so I would have concerns there with regard to separation okay, of powers. Okay, well, what would be the legal privilege you're asserting if you assert one then? Well, all I'm saying is that with regard to the information that is requested, it has been. Okay, provided. so again, you're not 
asserting illegal privilege, is there any reason, therefore, I should not get the documents or be able to interview the individuals that I requested to interview? Well, as I have said, that the uh, federal law provides for the resolution of these recusal questions, and each justice has to make those kinds of... Right. I'm not talking about recusal questions or what a Supreme Court justice might or might not do. I'm talking about my request for documents. I can't imagine any good reason why you would withhold them unless you were to assert a legal privilege, and then we could discuss a legal privilege. But I haven't heard you say you are asserting any legal privilege. Well, the documents I think that you have requested have essentially been released under a FOIA that has been filed, no, the, and those I, documents are available. No, the documents that I requested may or may not have been released. That's what we're trying to find out is what other documents might exist. We've also requested to interview two individuals, and uh, you have not agreed to let us interview those individuals. But if you're not asserting a legal privilege, then I'll move forward with scheduling those interviews and look forward to the documents. Well, we have not expressed, I guess at this point, uh, a legal privilege. What we have expressed, as I indicated before, constitutional concerns about the nature yeah. of the request. Yeah, I know, but concerns don't rise to the level of a legal privilege. If we all have concerns about a lot of subjects, I've expressed some of my concerns today. But if you're not going to assert a legal privilege, then I don't see any reason why I shouldn't get those documents and conduct those interviews. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, is recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you've got here uh, Chief Ralph Godby, uh, lots of other police chiefs and law enforcement people behind you. Would you tell us uh, how you partner with them to fight violent crime and particularly gun running with state and local police officers who are on the front line, sir? Well, the gentlemen who sit behind me and the people who they represent are essential partners in our fight against violent crime generally and against gun violence in particular. Um, the federal government relies on uh, our state and local partners who are obviously in the front lines in this fight. We try to support them in ways that we can. We try to come up with programs that protect um, their lives, but the reality is that in coming up with, and that's why I think these five gentlemen are so um, good to have here today. They are the ones who have come up with really innovative um, programs that we have tried to support and then tried to expand um, across the nation. Um, they are first and foremost great partners in, in this fight and uh, what they are doing in their cities are, are things that we're trying to replicate not only in other cities but in the work that we're doing along the southwest border as well. Thank you. Uh, tell me uh, where is the Mexican government in all of this gun running and violence and drug epidemics that, that goes on be, that usually starts in Mexico but eventually gets to the U.S. in the southwest area? What's, what's the Mexican government's role and attitude? How do you work with them? They have... Uh also been good partners. President Calderon has, I think, very courageously committed his government to fight the cartels. He has done so uh, in a way that has done, I think, at great you know, political cost. It has certainly cost the lives of many uh, Mexican law enforcement officials uh, who have been a part of this battle. 40,000 uh, people in Mexico have lost their lives over the course of the last five years in connection with this uh, with this fight. The Mexican government is committed to uh, eradicating the cartels. We have worked with them in unprecedented ways in terms of uh, extraditing people to the United States in cooperation, in sharing intelligence, and in working with vetted units um, in Mexico. We have moved resources to the southwest border and have uh, linked up with task forces with our Mexican partners. So. Our interaction with the Mexican government in dealing with these cartels is really kind of unprecedented. Well, I, m I mentioned uh, several things that we really ought to do in terms of getting on top of uh, not just the drug, the gun smuggling and gun walking, but the drug problem uh, as well. And you're our chief law enforcement officer in the nation. 
I know you're relying on uh, state and local law enforcement as well, but what are, the, what are the big issues? What's the big picture in terms of what it is we might want to consider in the Congress okay. uh, to help get on top of this and to help uh, you and the Department of Justice get on top of not only the drugs but the guns as well? Well, I think there are certain things <clears throat> that would be very helpful. There is no gun trafficking statute now or even an express uh, prohibition on straw purchasing. If Congress would consider legislation in that regard, I think that would be, uh, that would be good. We have to rely now on paperwork violations to try to get at um, gun traffickers and the sentences that are typically given for those kinds of technical violations are far too low for the serious nature of uh, the crimes. Um, it is far too easy for um, criminals to get their hands on weapons. Congressional support for the regulation that we put in place along those, in those four border states to deal with um, the long guns, the long guns that can be purchased there. Uh, a regulation that is consistent with what we already do uh, with regard to handguns uh, is something that congressional support would be, uh, would be important for. Um, so the, the possibility of having ways in which we could have a good dialogue about um, uh, effective measures that would uh, reduce the flow of guns to Mexico, make this nation more safe, protect the lives of people in law enforcement uh, in this country, and respect the Second Amendment at the same time uh, is something that uh, I think a, a meaningful, uh, good dialogue with members of Congress would be very productive. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Second Amendment so that uh, my friend and colleague, Daryl Issa, won't be nervous about the other strategies that you'll be using. I'll still be nervous. <laughs> uh, I thank you uh, very much, General Holder, and I return the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, is recognized for his questions. Uh, thank you very <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Holder, uh, I, I deeply appreciate your coming here to talk largely about Fast and Furious. And the way this has been handled within the Justice Department I think has put the Justice Department as an institution under a cloud that has not been exceeded since the infamous COINTELPRO scandal of the 1970s. And uh, you're at the top of the Justice Department. Do you think the buck stops with you? I'm ultimately responsible for all of the actions that okay. occur um, within the department. But I think as you look at what happened with regard to Fast and Furious and try to decide uh, what kind of performance uh, I have um, done in this regard. I think you have to look at what happened, uh, what I did once I learned of these matters. Well, well that's, that's a, you know, a question of, of when you learned it, because uh, there have been inconsistent submissions to Congress. You, know, you yourself testified that uh, uh, you'd only heard about it a few weeks earlier, and then in November you said it probably was a few months. Um, as late as October 7th, in response to the allegations that you lied on May 3rd, you wrote to Congress, your statements on Fast and Furious have been, quote, truthful and consistent. And then your underlings on February 4th, Assistant AG Ronald Weich responded to Senator Grassley denying that the ATF had walked guns, and that letter ended up being withdrawn. Um, you know, as Mr. Issa has said, um, uh, lying to Congress is a federal felony. Um, you know, I don't want to say that you have committed a felony, Mr. Attorney General, but obviously there have been statements so misleading that a letter had to be withdrawn. Uh, I think that some heads should roll, and I do agree with Senator Grassley that uh, Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, Lanny Breuer, uh, should be fired. Uh, and I know that that decision is not yours, but it is the President's. But I think that merely getting the head of uh, the ATF director at the time is not sufficient, since it's obvious 
that there was knowledge within the Justice Department. What are you going to do to clean up this mess? Well, first let me make something very clear, um, and in response to an assertion that you made or hinted at, uh, nobody in the Justice Department has lied. Nobody Why was the letter withdrawn? The letter was withdrawn because there was information in there that was um, inaccurate. The Justice Department letter of February... Okay, well, tell, tell me what's the difference between lying and misleading Congress in this context. Well, it, uh, if you want to have this legal art, uh, conversation, it all has to do with your state of mind and whether or not you had the requisite intent to come up with something that can be considered perjury or a lie. The information that was provided in that February 4th letter was gleaned by the people who drafted the letter after they interacted with people who they thought were in the best position well, to have the information. Okay. Now, now the, wag the wagons down the street are in a pretty tight circle, uh, you know, Mr. Attorney General. The American people need the truth. Uh, they haven't gotten the truth from what has been coming out of the Justice Department in the last year, and they were relying on Congress to get the truth. Now, you're here today, and again, I appreciate your being here today as a way to get the truth. Uh, but the answers that you have given uh, so far uh, uh, are basically saying, well, gee, somebody else did it. And, you know, there, there is really no responsibility within the Justice Department. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that if, if we don't get to the bottom of this, and that requires your uh, assistance on that, there is only one alternative that Congress has. And it's called impeachment, where our uh, uh, subpoena powers are plenary, and there can't be any type of illegal... Uh, um, uh, uh, immunity or privilege that can be uh, uh, asserted on that. Now, you know, I've done more impeachments than anybody else in the history of the country. It is an expensive and messy uh, uh, affair, and I don't want to go this far. But if we keep on getting pushed down the road, and the can keeps on getting kicked, and we don't get closure to this, what is Congress to do uh, so that we don't spend all of our time in court arguing privilege, which is uh, um, not a way to get at the truth? Well, the Justice Department has released facts, um, and I think that's what we need to focus on, facts. With regard to the creation of the February 4th letter, uh, I made the determination that we would release things that a Justice Department has never, ever released before, deliberative, core deliberative material about how that letter was put together, information that clearly could have been uh, withheld and has right. always been withheld by my predecessors and I expect by yeah. my successors um, as well. Getting to the bottom of this is something that we all want to do. The Inspector General, pursuant to my request, is conducting an investigation of this matter and I suspect we'll have uh, a great many more answers than we presently do. I don't have the ability to do a top to bottom investigation at this point out of deference to the investigation that is being done by the Inspector General. That does not, however, preclude me from taking action that I think appropriate based on information that comes to my attention in spite of the fact that the uh, Inspector General has an ongoing uh, investigation. Well, you won't have an independent counsel and we end up having the Justice Department uh, investigating itself in the absence of an independent counsel. And, uh, you know, having gone through interminable hearings on COINTELPRO, with all due respect, Mr. Attorney General, you've got to get this done much more quickly than uh, plugging the holes that COINTELPRO ended up showing uh, existed in the department at that time, and I yield back. Well, uh, 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 Chairman, I have a parliamentary uh, inquiry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. A parliamentary inquiry. For what reason does the gentlewoman from Texas seek I, to I be... I seek clarification. The gentleman in his questioning indicated impeachment. I was not sure which official or which person he was speaking of in terms of the impeachment. gentleman from Wisconsin was referring to the fact that while he was chairman of this committee uh, he oversaw the impeachment process uh, is the gentleman words from were, it, excuse is the parliament continue my uh, my inquiry the statement the said the only one alternative is impeachment I'm trying to determine that is not a parliamentary inquiry uh, the well, gentleman from California Mr. Berman is recognized thank you Mr. Question. Chairman and clarification thank Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, like to yield uh, a little time to the ranking member on 
this issue. Thank you, Howard Berman. I, I merely wanted to clear the record with uh, Jim Sensenbrenner. Uh, uh, I've had far more impeachment experience than he has. Uh, well, the gentleman yield. I've uh, been a manager. I, I, the the answer is, is, is only if the chairman allows my time to be extended. Uh, the, the gentleman from California is recognized for a full five minutes. That's correct. Uh, oh, all right. Then, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've heard a lot, some of it quite unbelievably overblown. Um, I'd like to give you some of the truth as I see it. You are on record as admitting that the Fast and Furious program was a fundamentally flawed program. Fast and Furious is only one program in many undertaken by the U.S. law enforcement authorities, not only to limit the harm of illegal gu gun trafficking, but also, most important, achieve the broader goal of protecting U.S. and Mexican citizens. There got to be a little perspective on what's going on in the U.S.-Mexico relationship on this issue. Once President Calderon made the historic decision to take the fight directly to the drug cartels, Law enforcement, both in Mexico and the United States, became more complicated and more dangerous. And the fact is, and I see it from a Foreign Affairs Committee perspective as well as from this perspective, uh, that U.S.-Mexico law enforcement cooperation and general cooperation is wider and deeper today than it has ever been in the history of our two nations. Uh, uh, the Department of Justice has apprehended and extradited an unprecedented number of criminals, including some of the most dangerous cartel leaders. They have successfully investigated violent crimes committed against American nationals in Mexico and along the border. They have trained hundreds of Mexican prosecutors and police officers, many of whom work side by side with U.S. counterparts on these shared goals. The level of intelligence sharing and cooperation is unprecedented at this particular time. We also have to acknowledge the negative impact caused by the significant stream of guns going into Mexico from the United States. Every day, thousands of guns are smuggled across the United States border into Mexico, making citizens of Mexico and the United States less safe. The U.S. southwest border states, south West border states, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California are the top four source locations for firearms received and traced in Mexico back to the United States. Uh, General Holder, I'm wondering if you could develop, you, I think you got into this a little bit with Ranking Member Conyers, uh, what could the Congress be doing in terms of funding, in terms of passing laws to help yeah. make this a successful endeavor. I would like you to just expand on some of those specific issues. Are we giving you the resources you need to make this cooperation produce the goal that both countries' governments share? Well, frankly, no. Uh, we have sought um, additional legislative um, enhancements to our abilities to deal with the gun trafficking problem, as I indicated to uh, the ranking member. We've also sought funds to increase the number of ATF agents who operate in these teams um, along the southwest border. Uh, I think we requested funds so that we'd have 14 of these teams. Uh, that number was reduced based on the funding level that we got to about seven or eight, I believe, which uh, decreased our ability to act or interact effectively or as effectively as we might with our uh, Mexican counterparts. Um, so there are funding issues, there are issues with regard to uh, the uh, confirmation of an ATF director, a permanent ATF director. Uh, there are legislative statutory tools that we could use um, from Congress and that we have proposed. All of these things would help us in our fight against the dr gun trafficking problem that you have, I think, so rightfully identified. The only thing I, I guess I would just close with the simple statement that as we pursue responsibly our oversight responsibilities on a program that you have stated was fundamentally flawed, uh, that we keep in mind our obligations as a Congress 
to help something that I think there is a broad consensus must continue, must expand, and must achieve the goals that our two governments are committed to, and to have some perspective on what's going on. That perspective seems to have been lost in some of the rhetoric that has uh, uh, come in recent months. Would the gentleman I yield? I yield would, back. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, do I have time to yield? You do. The, uh, the gentleman has five seconds left. Yeah, I, I, I yield. I would, uh, I would just make the point that, it's, that Fast and Furious is not a program. We've been repeatedly told it's less than a program. It's just an operation. Mm -hmm. Just an operation. The gentleman is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. There's a um, I, I take your point. I just don't quite understand it. Uh, well, just that... Uh, that, as the that when, when we try to... When as we, the, just the gentleman from California has the time. Would the gentleman continue to yield? I thank the gentleman. The, uh, the point that I'm making is, is that there is a wide question of a lot of things that go on at justice, and I agree with the gentleman that we need to look at the overall management of justice, but this small operation and the w refusal to give us the truth early on I, has caused it to be a bigger... I, I appreciate the time. I also would love to hear about... Congress's agenda to make this cooperation truly as effective as it could be. Funding, the legislation regarding the, uh, uh, the paper trail on guns, and, uh, and all the other things that the general mentioned that we should be doing. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Uh, the Judiciary Committee will stand in recess until immediately after the series of four votes. I do not expect to take a lunch break, so when we return, we will proceed until the next series of votes about 1.15. Uh, we stand in recess until after these votes. What about my flight time? Uh, we switched to four. Thank you.